Kia ora. I am so excited to share with you this upcoming sets of interventions we are going to create at Kea for the month of March 2020. This is a recognition and a remembrance of the white supremacist uh, terrorist attack in Christchurch. Um, it is also an invitation for us uh, to imagine a world that is free uh, of racism. So our series for uh, 2020 is titled Anti-Racism, Imagining a New Future. As part of this uh, series, we will have activists, communication advocates, academics talking about various aspects of racism, how it impacts our lives, and most importantly, what are the kinds of communication solutions we can create uh, to address racism, placing the voices of um, minority communities, indigenous communities, communities of color, migrants and refugees at the center. The culture-centered approach grapples with the question, what really happens to the discursive and communicative infrastructure when we place the voices of the margins at the center? So as part of that conversation, we uh, will begin by locating our own bodies, our own voices, our own experiences navigating racism as well as developing interventions addressing racism. Part of this work is uh, disrupting the colonizing structures that inhabit universities, uh, starting to question and interrogate uh, the very nature of colonization uh, that uh, constitutes the architecture of academia. So I'm really excited that uh, we are going to actually begin our conversations um, for the next couple of months uh, by talking to the research team and talking to research team members. Today we are going to uh, speak with uh, Christine Ellers, um, who goes by the uh, Maori name Nahao. And uh, Christine is a research assistant with the Center for culture-centered approach to research and evaluation. She does some incredible work uh, looking at questions of indigenous sovereignty, um, indigenous health and well-being, as well as foregrounding notions of uh, Tinoranga Tiratanga at the center of how we think about communication and discursive architectures. Uh, so Christine comes with us with experience um, in law and with experience um, running a school, a Maori school. So really, we are very excited uh, to chat with you, Christine, because of the uh, tremendous world experiences and life experiences that you bring to this conversation. So um, let's begin by perhaps talking a little bit about um, um, how you would like to introduce yourself. Ko tainu i te waka, ko ngā te kaipata tiwi, ko ngā hau e whao te motu tōku ingoa Māori, ko Christine tōku ingoa uh, Pākehā. Kia ora. Kia ora. Um, so Christine, uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, your work with CARE and what you do at the centre. Okay, I am a junior researcher and I've been at CARE since May last year. Um, at the moment, I'm involved in three projects. Uh, one is uh, examining the meanings of Māori health and wellbeing. Um, and when I say examining the meanings, I mean um, at the at the coalface, um, by the people themselves, by the whānau uh, in the Māori community themselves in Ngāti Kaupata. Uh, some whānau who have um, uh, who have generously, generously shared with me uh, uh, their positioning on Māori health, what that means to them. And that canvassed a whole lot of areas, including land, um, racism, education, employment, housing, poverty. There were some really beautiful articulations. Um, and then from there, uh, I have assisted in the I2 Taibri campaign. And uh, just recently, I've also assisted with the um, anti-racism campaign 
it just started last week. Hmm. Hmm. So how in this work that you have done so far, have you seen racism as a concept emerge? Um, I've seen it uh, through uh, dialogue with um, our whānau participants that um, racism is very much um, entrenched in Aotearoa New Zealand. In fact, I would even go as far as to say as it's part of the Kiwi DNA and infrastructure of this society. Mm. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Wow. Mm. Uh, so what makes it a part <laughs> of the Kiwi DNA? Um, I think there's a whole lot of factors, but primarily um, colonisation underpins it. Yeah, racism, white supremacy, colonisation. There's a almost intentional misremembering or an amnesia about how... Sorry, I'm going to go. I'm going to cry. There's an intentional amnesia around that, uh, to prop up whiteness. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is a powerful point, you know, this notion of um, intentional amnesia. I think of that, uh, that as sort of a strategic erasure, mm -hmm. you know, sort of how you uh, create a story or a narrative to strategically erase uh, the racism that actually exists yeah right so mm -hmm. sort of the picture of Aotearoa New Zealand that you see being mm. projected is one of a kind uh, society that is based on the idea of the treaty um, that that sometimes perhaps is challenged mm. uh, by people's lived experiences isn't it um, yes very much so I think um, there's a whole lot of uh, structural inequalities that are the outcomes of this entrenched racism. Um, I think that um, just from reading on social media, your typical Kiwi responses doesn't um, doesn't even consider or or wish to know uh, the 250 years that got us to this situation in the first place. Mm. Hmm. There's a general feeling of just, you know, that happened in the past, get over it. Yeah. But um, I guess in listening to communities, indigenous communities, I'd say that um, uh, that's, a, that's a narrative, like you said, that erases that historical trauma and that it, it is still a consequence, it's still an outcome today because it's passed through the generations. It's even uh, affected... Um, you know, to the point of cellular invasion, you know, in that micro level mm. in terms of um, whānau experiences of racism. Mm. Yeah. How does this cellular invasion sort of play out? I mean, does it, do you mean like it plays out on the body, it's felt in the body? Mm. Yes. Yeah, so um, our ancestors, our parents, stories of racism, even though we weren't there in the 1800s or the not early 1900s, um, I guess we still feel that hurt through them, through their experiences. Mm. And, and those experiences um, are even told in some of our uh, motiatea, our traditional songs. Mm. Yeah. So if you are, um, you know, if you're able to get in the space to learn that, then that's just a constant reminder as well, yeah, of the racism and the trauma that they experienced. Mm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Two questions. One, you talk about sort of the structural aspects of racism yes. um, that exist in New Zealand society. What do you mean by that? Could you uh, share some examples? Um, well, if if you're a Māori or a person of colour and you go to uh, try to access some kind of service, whether that health, education, um, there are structural um, inequalities. Um, you may not get treated the same as, as um, a Pākehā person. Um, looked down upon, 
Mm. Um, the aspirations or the motivation to assist you to pursue your goals isn't necessarily or well, doesn't come across as um as what's the word I'm looking for as um as as valid as honest you know just just an uh, just a name on a bit of paper next mm -hmm. yeah mm. now you know one of the structures we inhabit while doing this work is the university mm -hmm. academia um, how do those kinds of research formations play out within um, universities as structures oh gosh uh, I think they're everywhere um, I recall when I was a, a university student taking an assignment to there was a like a English um, help thing that can read your assignment and give you feedback on grammar. Um, instead, um, the lady, Parker lady, uh, chose to not to give me feedback on grammar, but rather on the content, which was about racism. <laughs> 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 and instead she purported to tell me that we were racist, Māori was racist and sexist. And I was just like, I haven't come for that. <laughs> like, your role is the grammar. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, oh, I think um, I think it pervades in universities racism, um, and you know my daughter possibly could be going to university next year, and it scares me. Mm. Yeah. Now you know you have shared with me uh, stories about your daughter's navigation, and. Uh, share those only if you feel comfortable mm. but it seems like some uh, threads there uh, relate to sort of this sense of fear that you feel about mm. her going into a university as well right mm. yes um i worry that she'd just be a, a number um that uh, for her to engage meaningfully in a subject um she needs to feel valued, yeah. not just another face, not just another name or a number. Um, not only that, the content, um, the content of the curriculum, whatever that may be, that she might choose to pursue, um, maybe so foreign and alien to her that she won't invest her time or energy into it. Um, and even if the content isn't foreign, the way that that's delivered, uh, she can pick up on whether that's um, heartfelt or not. Yeah. Uh, for example, she's um, in, in school at the moment um, learning about the Treaty of Waitangi. She hates it. She doesn't hate the Treaty of Waitangi, she hates learning about it the way that she's learning about it. Um, that, so there's historical information, right, that's transmitted from teacher to student, but just in the way that that's transmitted, in the tone, in the selection of words used, um, she comes home feeling feeling like our ancestors were dumb. Yeah, that's the way that the information has been conveyed to her. Dumb for signing the treaty. Why would you sign it when all you got were blankets? That sort of a impression. So then I have to fix that up at home. Mm -hmm. How do you fix that up? Um, by referring it to other readings, yeah. Um, no more so in school they're watching videos, mm. I refer it to different ones. It's almost like a, um, a blackout list of what not to read or watch. <laughs> 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 yeah. So yeah. you almost have to uh, work at creating an alternative pedagogy. Mm. Yes. Right. Yeah. But you know, you also bring up a powerful point, I think, which is sort of the inclusion of the Treaty of Waitangi, mm. for example, as an element of the pedagogy or element of the curriculum mm. or the element of the structure. A is not enough, yes. but B can actually work to perpetuate further disenfranchisement of Maori people. Yes. Yeah. Mm. Mm. So, you know, when I question teachers that teach that 
you know, their intent. What is your intent behind that? Before you teach it, they, I think they need to question themselves about that. But particularly when you're standing in front of a class full of Māori students. Yeah, if, 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 you, if you aren't prepared to interrogate your own views on it, then don't put yourself in front of our kids, is my view. Mm. Mm. Do more damage than anything. You'd rather just tell them to research it themselves. They'd come up with a better, a better analysis themselves. They're very quite capable of that. Mm. Yeah. So do you see the treaty as a positive resource? Treaty of Waitangi, Te Tiriti of Waitangi. Well, um, gosh, I think it needs. I think there needs to be some kind of constitutional transformation um, that does more than give lip service to it. Mm. And until that happens, until there's just some real structural transformation around that, then uh, this is what we're going to have to endure, and our children, and their children. So what's the kind of constitutional uh, transformation that could happen um, that uh, sort of would be a positive uh, anchor to um, deploying the treaty toward, uh, you know, uh, positive goals that are meaningful to Māori? Mm. Um, I think... Moana Jackson's done some research on how, uh, or done some recent research on constitutional transformation. Um, I think it needs to be entrenched into the documents that form our constitution. Um, but really, that that should come from the ground up, mm, rather mm. than at a political expert level. Um, but even Perhaps even prior to that, maybe um, I don't even know if our communities themselves have been asked about that. What does the te tiriti or waitangi mean to you? Mm. So a lot of groundwork I think that needs to be done. Mm. Yeah. Does that not happen? You know, so say for instance, when you have te tiriti or waitangi uh, hearings. Mm -hmm. um, do the voices from the ground not emerge through those? Well, it's a, um, a quasi-judicial body, so it's like a court hearing where you have lawyers and there's cross-examination of your witnesses. Um, and those witnesses typically are your expert witnesses or they come through the lawyers themselves or the his historians. Um, so for the first part of that, in our one next month, it's the experts. And then in May, possibly the community, the whānau. Mm. Yeah, because the Crown lawyers, ha um, you know, have that right to cross-examine everybody mm. that speaks. Mm. Mm -hmm. And they will dig, you know, because they want to um, put holes in you, your evidence. Mm. Yeah. So, you know, it's really interesting because that instrument, much like uh, many other instruments that can be emancipatory, mm -hmm. could also be deeply colonial and uh, reproduce uh, the structures of uh, racism and divide and rule. Yeah, very much so. Mm. Yes, that's the, um, that's the process or the, the court process that we have to go through if we want to pursue that. Mm. Mm. There is no other avenue currently. So now, so what happens, so let's, let's connect this to the question of racism. So what happens when, um, say, a Maori student or a, a, a Maori employee in an organization experiences racism? What mechanisms do they usually have available to them? Legal mechanism? Yes. Um, uh, you can raise it um, via your employment agreement. Um, there's also the Human Rights Commission as well. Um, but I understand, um, I don't think, 
I was looking on the um, Human Rights Commission last week. Not very many complaints. They don't receive very many complaints. Um, and it's a arduous process. Gosh, it's almost like a full-time job just to, you know, put that start, get that process in motion. I think if the process was simpler, um, that might help. And also who makes the decision on that at the end of the day as well. Mm. Yeah, uh, just that the uh, freedom of speech um, co-papa that we've been uh, researching recently, um, the test for that, uh, for hate speech, is so high that it's almost impossible to ever win that in a court of law. Mm. Yeah. So let's take Hobson's Pledge as mm. an example. Yeah. Um, how does one uh, litigate against uh, that kind of racist speech? Well, if you go through the courts, you're not going to find any, not going to get any success there. I don't believe. Um, first, you have to prove that um, the the speech or the hate speech uh, caused injury. Could cause injury. That that's okay. But then the next th the next test is that you have to prove that um, the person intended to incite hatred, and it's a objective test. This reasonable person test that doesn't exist. That's usually a white person. From that standpoint, uh, the courts will determine whether or not freedom of speech or the freedom of expression incited hatred. Mm. Mm. So this is a great example. Yeah. Because the way in which then that structure is set up in terms of what counts and how it is going to count are embedded within, it seems like, logics of um, whiteness. Oh yes, very much so. Yeah. yeah. So do you want to talk a little bit about whiteness, what that construct is and connected to sort of perhaps these um, uh, uh, processes or norms within structures and the ways in which those are set up? Um, okay, well, I understand it to be um, structural advantage, the ideology of whiteness, structural advantage based on past and present, um, subordination, people of colour, um, a, a um, superior complex and how that's connected to structural inequalities. Oh, it pervades structure, like just as we were talking about um, the court system, uh, there's no escaping it. Um, should you, uh, you know, raise a complaint then that complaint is going to be judged or determined or reasoned within that structure. So of course all you're going to get is a, is a, a decision that's soaked in whiteness. There's okay. no other option. Mm. Yeah. Mm. See, I, I find this really powerful now because it seems like then if you want to decolonize, mm. Right, that part of our work has to be about interrogating these very normative ideas and logics mm. rather than taking them for granted and starting to work with them. I mean, we know we have to work with them in order to get somewhere, mm -hmm. but at the same time, it seems like we have to do the work of dismantling them and making visible their taken for granted assumptions. Mm. Yes, I'm not too sure whether they're fully aware of it themselves. Um, that, you know, the, the whiteness of the structures and the immense privilege that's, that, that exists in there. I think some people are, but I think a lot of people are, are oblivious to it. Mm. Yeah. I was just um, this morning um, with my daughter talking to her dean about a um, possible program that she might do. Um, and straight off the bat, I could see the privilege in that. That, oh, this is only for this certain type of people, but she couldn't see that. I had to point it out. <laughs> yeah. Mm, you know, but otherwise, um, there's a, 
there's a thinking of if you just try hard, if you're just motivated enough, you'll succeed. Yeah. Well, no, it's not that simple. <laughs> yeah, it's not. Uh, it's not about motivation or trying. It's there are some um, structural ob um, obstacles that prevent you from even trying in the first place. Yeah. And those so, obstacles are written in codes of whiteness. Yes. So rather than turning that back on the individual and saying, "Oh well, you didn't try hard enough," well, no, actually, have a look at your processes. Mm. Yeah. How um, open are they and receptive are they for all people and not just those that are, have privilege that are able to afford to do that or you know, are able to get themselves to here and there on a weekly basis. So have you thought through that? Mm. No. Hmm. Yeah. So, you know, what I find really fascinating here is how uh, sort of the logic of whiteness sets up uh, certain norms and expectations mm -hmm. and in this process excludes and creates the margins mm -hmm. right? but then goes on to reproduce racist arguments such as oh this particular community mm -hmm. has underachieved underachieved yeah or has um, a higher uh, rate of delinquency or a mm -hmm. higher rate of crime mm. Yes. Yeah. So, how does one, like, you know, the exam, give the example of speaking with your daughter, because mm. it seems like a lot of it is internalized, mm. um, internalized by peoples who are colonized, because that's how the colonizing uh, epistemology works, right? So, how do we learn to interrogate that and question that? Um. Uh, well, I'm amazed at, you know, children, how, you know, how much they can detect and pick up um, just from body language, the, like I said, the tone, I'm, it just blows me away. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, I think they, they should be teaching the class sometimes, not the other way around. Um, and I mean, that's, that's really all I can hope for as a parent, is that, um, you know, through our interactions as a whānau, um, that, um, that, you know, they're able to decipher, because there's a lot of deciphering that goes on. Um, I, I wouldn't say authentic, uh, it's the only word I can come up with, but, you know, really meaningful pedagogy that really engages them, and then just um, cut out that, that, that which doesn't. Um, quite difficult for them to change it, challenge that in a school environment because you're threatened with a lot of disciplinary action. Mm. Mm. Um, but yeah, just, we talk a lot about it at home. Yeah, oh, frequently, you know, weekly at least. Yeah, yeah. And then when you pick up from that, um, Naha, and take questions such as say, violence mm -hmm. or what um, is considered as crime within a particular context. How does one set up a dialogic space between recognizing uh, the whiteness and the colonial architecture mm. and at the same time uh, addressing um, sort of the um, oppressive effects of violence uh, within the immediate contexts of say a Panao? or an EV? Oh, I think, um, well, you do your best, the best that you can at the time. Uh, with whānau, uh, lots of dialogue and discussion around that. No, not everybody's going to agree, and that's okay too. The main thing is that there is discussion. Um, how do you kind of reconcile that, you mean? Mm. Well, um, crime or violence is in every culture and every institution um, may not necessarily be physical but there might be um, you know I think um, I think sometimes when uh, Pākehā people launch into research about Māori that can be violent particularly in the tone and the way that they carry themselves that can be hugely violent and cause trauma 
Um, I think it's not limited to uh, minority cultures mm. Mm, or, or Māori. Um, and that, 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 that does exist is primarily a result of colonisation. Mm. Yeah. You know, this, this part I find so powerful um, because um, part of the idea here is that what gets uh, framed in the cultural uh, label mm. and what kinds of cultural labels otherwise are erased or absent. Going back to your, um, your question of memory making, right? So we mm. don't talk about uh, Pakeha culture being violent, mm -hmm. um, although we might have uh, enough ample uh, mm -hmm. empirical evidence to document that and then to frame that as a culturalist argument, mm -hmm. right? So um, think, you know, how you pick particular statistics and use certain labels to frame those statistics mm. itself is a deeply ideological act that is embedded within a racist structure. Yes, yes. Um, for the purpose of... Um um, bolstering themselves, yeah, as as the supremacists, mm. yeah, and, and I think it's tied up with wealth and assets as well, yeah, and to be able to say, see that, that's why um, certain cultures aren't uh, don't live as long or, or aren't as healthy, yeah. it's their fault, the crimes they commit, yeah. That sort, that sort of an argument. Mm. Right. Yeah. Which then upholds, like you're saying, white supremacy. Yes. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, we don't turn around and ask, you know, I, I study health. And, and, and I'm amazed at how often we don't say that, oh, you know, this culture of eating fast food, McDonald's and KFC, yes. that's white culture. Yes. That's mm. whiteness and white culture and how it is killing it us is. all through its colonizing processes. Right? Yes. That's right, yeah, <laughs> very much so. <laughs> yeah. um, so, you know, one of the things uh, that I think we struggle in our work is that just making these kinds of arguments, like what you're, uh, you and I are doing right now, mm -hmm. um, brings backlash from the white structure. So that's mm -hmm. part of the racism as well, that one has to live navigate yes. when as academics or activists we do this work. Mm. Um, how do you feel about that and how do you navigate that? Um, yeah, uh, it's, you know what's going to happen. Um, for the most part, um, well I can give a most recent example, our Whenua occupation. Um, and well, the backlash from that from from the immediate community or one resident actually, uh, she turned it back on to our aunties and said that they were selfish for stopping the stock bank on their land. It was a selfish act. Um, now, well, for me personally, I just thought she doesn't know what she's talking about didn't particularly worry me, but it worried our other members in our whānau, you know, like it enraged them, um, because we know that our aunties aren't selfish, you know, they give and give, they give you, you know, the last, anything that they had, that, that, that's, uh, that's who they are. Um, uh, but I think the media uh, was integral in, in um, bolstering that argument, because they purposely sought it out, you know sort out somebody who would speak out against um, the, the land occupation. Mm. I mean over time, over, you know, with, as you get older, um, you come to expect that because you see it all the time. Mm. So the media as structures of storytelling yes. are embedded in logics of whiteness. Mm. Yeah. Yes, yeah. So you anticipate that. How do you navigate that but also how do you resist that then? Um, well, you try not to get your cousins to beat them up. <laughs> 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 that in itself takes a lot of dialogue. <laughs> um, so in terms of the kinds of response you're going to have, yes, right? Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, honestly, you try not to get them to beat them up. <laughs> 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 and then unfortunately um, with care we had a platform. 
we were able to use a, utilize our, our platform here to put out um, their own stories that weren't twisted. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that was vital. Yes. Yeah. Mm. So now, you know, to me, this seems like a vital element of what we do at CARE, mm. is to say that if these kinds of communication infrastructures mm, reproduce this racist colonial ideology, we need to create alternative infrastructures that are sovereign, mm. that are not owned by these hegemonic colonial institutions. Yes. Right? Yeah. Um, how do you think we sustain that? We here at CARE? Here at CARE or uh, even within a movement, say, oh. Matau, you know, when yes. they create this beautiful mm. way of telling their stories. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm not too sure how they sustained it. I mean, it looked from the outside, looking in, it looked very well resourced. Um, yeah, I, um, I don't know how many communities or whānau have access to that. Um, we're just lucky that we ha we were able to access that through care. Um, I don't know, I've seen on Facebook there is um, another whānau around the East Coast area that have just started their land occupation as well. And they're going live on Facebook. Mm -hmm. I think you just reach out to, um, or use networks within your communities, try and find a way of doing that. Or if worse comes to worse, then just going live on your, on your phone. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So do you, do you find these digital technologies are playing a role in sort of dis at least disrupting some of the uh, colonialism and racism? Yes, yeah, I think I think very much so, yeah. Um, compared to, say, 10, 20 years ago, when you the, all you had was the media, or if you wrote a letter to the editor, and it would be abridged anyway, you know, you sort of didn't have any control over that. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Do you see change happening? Um, in the near future, oh, well, I, I'm hopeful, you know, that, that um, change would happen. Um, I think that it might get worse before it gets better. Mm. I think that, um, you know, we really need to look after our children and prep them as best we can, because I think it's going to be worse in there uh, when they're older than, than what I've experienced. Mm. And I, um, why I think that is because of the huge gap, the inequalities in wealth that exist now um, that didn't seem to be so severe when I was growing up. It's hugely severe now. Like we didn't, in fielding, there wasn't homelessness mm. when I was growing up. Yeah. Um, and, and just in my mum's generation, it was the whole urbanisation drift. Um, so I think... Um, the next generation has got a whole lot more um, obstacles to get through. Mm. Yeah. So what do you think we could do as care in our work uh, to sort of um, address some of these immediate challenges but that also seem to have a really long-term impact, you know? Mm. Um, I think we might need some more staff. <laughs> More community researchers. Yes. Um, I'm not too sure if uh, being cited here in, at the university is something that's um, appealing to our community people to come here. Um, yeah. It takes a lot of courage to come here is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Yeah, to the university. Mm. So think also about the spaces where yeah. we situate mm. our infrastructures, mm. right? Yes. Yeah. 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 And then, so sort of, let's start wrapping up. Um, I want to ask you, in terms of addressing, you know, we began by talking about racism and the uh, history of racism that has been erased. What then can be done? You know, we have. Um, anti-racism 2020. Oh, yes. What then can be done through that platform uh, to address uh, racism? Um, well, in Fielding we're working on a um, 
kaupapa at the moment, a campaign at the moment, um, that is based on um, anti-racism, or it's what we say matters, uh, across a whole range of subjects. And um, I just think chipping away little by little, yeah, um, ensuring that um, our whānau, particularly those that reside on the margins, um, that their voices emerge through, that together mm. we continue to co-construct those infrastructures, mm. voice and listening, um, because I think um, even, even in our iwi um, structure, um, decisions are made um, at a level that doesn't include the margins of the margins. Albeit, you know, in, in the, with the best intention, um, but still, the best intention is not the same as having ownership by the people themselves. Mm. Yeah. So that's the ongoing challenge, really, mm. for building these infrastructures for voices, mm. especially those of those that are experiencing um, the inequalities. Mm. the material inequalities as well as the voice inequalities. Yes, they seem to go hand in hand. Yes. Yeah. They're, they're intertwined. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Excellent. Mm. Um, so as we wrap up, do you have any um, uh, uh, remaining thoughts or any questions you want to ask me? Um, um, in terms of our anti-racism campaign that we're about going to launch into, um, what are your hopes for it? You know, actually, I resonate a lot with what you just said. Uh, my hopes are that we listen to uh, those voices, because let's go back to what you started us with, saying that there have been systematic erasures mm. uh, that are um, not accidental, they are by design. Um, mm -hmm. the erasures of experiences of racism, experiences of colonization and violence. Mm. So my hope is that once we work on co-constructing these infrastructures, that we have plurality of voices, many different voices uh, that articulate their everyday experiences, their everyday uh, negotiations, and also offer us pathways for imagining other futures that are just, mm -hmm. that are not racist. Uh, that are based on valuing different ways of knowing and mm. respecting the world, you know. Mm. Yeah. yeah, those reimaginings are really vital, aren't they? Yes. Because without that, then it almost feels hopeless. Yes. Yeah. Mm. And then once we start reimagining, as mm. you rightly point out, uh, children, mm. they have amazing capacities mm. to reimagine and creatively um, uh, sort of ideate new worlds with new possibilities mm -hmm. and gosh we need them you know yes right. now how uh, christine ellis has been my uh, pleasure to have you uh, chat with me this is the first uh, care conversation in the series so you're incredibly brave in doing this <laughs> <laughs> and to our audience we will continue to have these conversations hope you will join us but more importantly Please do share your thoughts, your ideas on Facebook as comments and that's also part of building uh, the voice uh, democracy. We look forward to learning and developing strategies so that we can co-create uh, a just imaginary. Thank you. Thank you, Professor.